Good morning. Welcome to Our Redeemer. We're in the midst of several weeks where we find Jesus engaging with his critics. And today in a dialogue back and forth with the Pharisees, Jesus sums up God's law, what he has told us to do, and then leads us into the gospel, which tells us what our God has done for us in Christ. And it's those two great teachings of the Bible that will be front and center in our service today. We'll begin with our opening hymn. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear friends, let us approach God with a true heart and confess our sins, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin. For faithless worrying and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do, you should cast me away from your presence forever. O oh Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake.
Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. In his great mercy, God made us alive in Christ, even when we were dead in our sins. Hear the word of Christ through his called servant. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Mercifully grant, O God, that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts. For without your help, we are unable to please you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Everything the Lord has commanded is summed up in the command to love God with all our heart and soul and mind. A lesson from Deuteronomy chapter 10. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments and statutes of the Lord which I am commanding you today for your good. Behold, 
To the Lord your God belong heaven and the heaven of heavens, and the earth with all that is in it. Yet the Lord set his heart in love on your fathers and chose their offspring after them, you above all peoples, as you are this day. Circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of your heart and be no longer stubborn. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, who is not partial and takes no bribe. He executes justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the sojourner, giving him food and clothing. Love the sojourner, therefore, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. You shall fear the Lord your God. You shall serve him and hold fast to him, and by his name you shall swear. He is your praise. He is your God, who has done for you these great and terrifying things that your eyes have seen. The word of the Lord.
The grace of God is given, not earned. A lesson from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any gift, as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 22. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question, saying, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, how is it then that David in the spirit calls him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. This is the Gospel of the Lord.
Grace, mercy, and peace are yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The American way of life has for a long time been marked by being both very religious and passionate about pursuing pleasure in the present moment. You can draw the line all the way back to our founding documents, and it's there in the Declaration of Independence, which states that a creator, there's your religion, has endowed us with the inalienable right to pursue happiness. There's that pleasure in the present moment. The history of our nation bears this out, and if today we feel like perhaps the scales are starting to tip a little more in the direction of the pursuit of present pleasures and a little less in the religious category, I suppose all of us ought to be asking ourselves if we haven't been swept right along with that tide. I think at the end of the day, what we are are people who love Jesus plus something. We want to love and serve the Lord, but to be honest, we also pin some hopes for our fulfillment in those present projects and pleasures that we are going after right now. It's great that I have Jesus, but the thing that really stokes my fire is this workout program I've started. It's launching me towards my ultimate goal of running the Boston Marathon, and that's the thing that really gets me excited. Or, yeah, I pray, but I don't think I'll ever really be fulfilled in life until I have a romantic partner, until a Mr. Perfect or Miss Wonderful comes along and sweeps me off my feet. Then... I will be fulfilled. I love Jesus, plus my vacations, plus my children, plus the name I'm making for myself in my career. You get the picture. The thing is, we don't often stop to think about that even the Declaration of Independence was honest enough to tell us that we can only pursue these things. We are not guaranteed ever to achieve any of them. The inalienable right is only to the pursuit, not the achieval of, pers of happiness here in this life and in this moment. And therein lies the great problem we have when we try to have it all, both Jesus and something else. In trying to pursue all of these other things, how often don't we come up empty? A look around us will tell the tale of countless souls who have pursued with vigor. And at the end of the day, all they have to show for it is exhaustion on the inside. Maybe some of those souls are sitting right here in the pews this morning. We have tried, but for all of our efforts to have Jesus plus something else, we wind up empty. There is an exclusivity when it comes to the kingdom of God that is incompatible with this American hope, that you can both love the Lord plus your luxuries, your hobbies, your side hustles. See, when Jesus was asked what the great command in God's law is, he was being asked what makes for a flourishing and thriving life, how our humanity is intended to be lived out as God himself designed it to be. And this is a question Jesus received from those who were testing him that he didn't have to dodge at all. He had a reply ready right at his fingertips, an answer to that question that is as simple and beautiful as it is also biting. And in fact, maybe its simplicity and its beauty actually masks the sting that is hidden inside of it. Jesus was ready when the Pharisees tried to test him, and he answered very simply, you want to know what the great command in, is in God's law? It's this, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And it's that word all that's repeated three times and applied to three different words that have to do with our inner existence, heart, soul, and mind that I'm thinking of when I think of a, a level of exclusivity here. That word all means something like the totality, the entirety, the whole of it. That is to say that God's plan for you, 
for a flourishing and thriving life is that every fiber of your being would love him. That every throb of your heart, every hope that is nurtured there, every desire and wish of your soul, every thought of your mind would be wholly, entirely, exclusively his. That you should love God and nothing else. Not God plus, just God. The Lord your God and him alone. This is what our Lord would have us do. He would have us turn ourselves inside out so that we'd be wholly focused on him because our Lord knows that so long as we remain turned in on ourselves, we will forever be imprisoned in this eternal quest for self-actualization, self-fulfillment, self-help, self-improvement, self-care that promises the world but at the end of the day leaves us coming up short. Our God would much rather have us lose ourselves in him because in so doing, we would find every fulfillment and happiness and flourishing as our God intended us to be. This is what I mean when I say that the beauty and simplicity of this command masks its sting. I can see in this command to love God That if I could, with all my heart and soul and mind, with every fiber of my being, love the Lord my God in every moment, that then I would know joy and bliss that I cannot even imagine right now. But because I can't, what does that leave me with? I am literally made for this. My God has shown it to me. But... To the extent that I do not love him with all my heart and soul and mind, not only do I break that first great command of the law, but I also find all of the restlessness and heartache and disappointment and pointlessness that is the inevitable harvest I reap when I sow seeds on anything that is not the soil of love for God and God alone. The fact that my God should show me what my life should be like, and yet in my own life I find oftentimes misery and a life that doesn't necessarily give me endless joy, that sometimes my God, in fact, seems far off. Well, this is the curse of God's law. It shows me life as it should be, as my God designed me to live, But it shows me a life that is forever out of my reach. I can only see it from a distance and see how I myself fall up, fall short, and cannot attain it on my own. And that is why God's law, as it shows me my shortcoming, drives me to look for something greater. Or more specifically, it drives me to look for someone greater. See how Jesus continues this conversation with the Pharisees? He has given them the marching orders that they were looking for, the commands that they wanted to know about of loving God and loving neighbor. And I would imagine that in this moment, we might have expected Jesus to launch into an explanation for how those Pharisees in the future could do a better job of loving the Lord their God with all their heart and soul and mind. In fact, I wonder if that's what we often think sermons and Bible studies are all about, that we come together here in order to get a few pointers and tips for how we can try harder and do better in the future. How often when it comes to being close to God, don't our thoughts just run towards, well, I guess if I want to be close to God, I better do this or that or the other thing, whatever it is. But this is not at all what Jesus is going to talk with those Pharisees about. Instead, he asks them a question that turns them outside of themselves and towards another. He asks them this question, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? And in asking that question, Jesus, in effect, is saying, You want to talk all about commands and laws and rules. I want to talk about someone else. You want to talk about the law and about how you can do a better job of keeping it. 
I want to talk to you about how God has brought an end to the law by sending Messiah, the Christ. You are all hung up on yourself, but I will show you your God in the fullness of his love and grace and compassion for you. This is what Jesus is doing. And he asked them this question, and just as much as Jesus had an answer at his fingertips for the Pharisees' question, so they can readily answer this question for him. Whose son is the Messiah? Those Pharisees knew their scriptures. They knew that the Messiah was to come from the house and line of David. But of course, you know that Jesus didn't need a lesson in genealogy or a family tree. And so he draws them to something startling. That the scriptures not only tell us that this Christ, this Messiah, would be descended from the human ancestry of David, but that he would actually be someone much greater than David. Not just another mighty warrior king or a political leader, but David's own Lord. Jesus quotes the psalm and asks the Pharisees, how is it that the Christ could be both David's son and David's Lord? And well, you know the answer to that, don't you? You know that our God's great plan for us, because we cannot live the flourishing, fulfilled life that he designed for us on our own, is for God himself to step into this world of ours. For Jesus to come and to be born of the line of David, born in that town of Bethlehem, the city of David, because both stepfather Joseph and mother Mary belonged to David's family tree. His human ancestry belongs here. That is, the blood of David ran in Jesus' veins. And yet you know that this child was no ordinary child, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of a virgin. Our God come into our flesh to dwell among us so that David and Mary and the angels over Bethlehem's sky would all proclaim him to be their Lord. And so that you and I, too, would see in Jesus David's far greater son, God's great answer to our problem and our every need. His answer was to come among us as one of us and in Christ to live out this wholehearted, exclusive love for God that is at the same time perfect love for you, that supplies you with everything you need in this life and the next. What you could not do on your own, our God accomplished in Christ. What you could not be by yourself, God's own child, close to the Lord, beloved by him. All of that you are in Jesus. The longing that your heart has for a life of joy and fulfillment, this too is yours in Jesus Christ and nowhere else. You know, it's this gospel, it's what God himself has done for us that awakens in our hearts true love for God. It awakens in our hearts that love for God that looks to him and says, now I see it so clearly that, that what I could not do on my own, you have done for me because you loved me so. And therefore, I know now that I need nothing else than my Lord, my Jesus, my all in all. That is enough. Just Jesus and Jesus alone is enough for me to be utter and complete fulfillment in my life. This is what the gospel does. It awakens in our heart that love for God that you and I know is our true light and life. But this is where there is a surprising turn. Loving God with your heart and soul and mind doesn't mean that you get locked into some gray concrete box or you have nothing but you and God, does it? Our Lord has his own version of Jesus plus. It's just that rather than pursuing all of these other things with hopes that they will give us fulfillment, now we are given them so that we can receive them in hands that are open and hands that praise God and receive every good gift in this life with thanksgiving. In other words, our God is so gracious that, well, all we need is Jesus still 
He gives us so much more. The people in your life whom you love. The jobs you have that you work hard at where you make a difference in this world. The marathons you run. The cold swims you take in the ocean. The warm summer evenings that you spend beneath strings of glittering lights and cheerful conversation. For as much as sin has broken this world, there are still so many good things in it. And each one of them is a gift given to you by your God that you receive with thanksgiving. And that is just one more reason why you pin all your love on him. And you have an undivided heart that looks nowhere else but to your God and to what he has given you in Jesus in every moment and every circumstance. This love for God is something that our God begins to work in us here in this life as he works in our hearts through his gospel with his spirit. And it is begun and throughout our life it is only imperfect here on this earth. But when he brings us to heaven, then it will be truly undivided and complete. And you and I will know the bliss and joy that is on beyond compare of loving God with every fiber of our being all the way through. It will be like nothing we have ever known. But that doesn't mean that for now here on this earth, we have to either try to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps or sit and lament and complain that we haven't done enough to grow close enough to God as we'd like. Rather, we sit here and marvel at how far our God has come to us and how much he has given to us in David's greater son, our Lord Jesus. And by that gospel, we live. By that gospel alone. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We confess our Christian faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This morning we'll continue to pray for Elnor Reichel and for recovery of health for her. Let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Almighty God, bless your church here in this place and scattered throughout the world. Fill all who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ with his love, that they might strive diligently to love you, one another, and all their neighbors. Lord, in your mercy. Generous Lord, we thank you for your delight in giving us all good gifts. Continue to bless us in both body and soul. Grant us generous hearts that we would support your ministry and mission among us and around the world with our offerings. Lord, in your mercy. Loving God, continue to be merciful to all those who are suffering under the burden of any illness or ailment of body, soul, or mind, especially Elnor Reichel. Strengthen and heal them according to your will and bless all the hands that care for them. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, grant that we would always be glad to go to the house of the Lord where we are fed and strengthened by your Son's body and blood at the holy altar. Fill us with your Spirit, that we would receive the sacrament in repentance and faith and to our abundant blessing. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, dear Father, we commend all for whom we pray. 
trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Good morning once again to all of you. Great to see you here today. Just one announcement I want to highlight. We have an opportunity to do good for some neighbors here in our community. Last week, Monday, uh, early Monday morning, a duplex in Verona burned to the ground, and uh, everybody was fortunately able to get out and safe. One of the young men is a brother of uh, one of our members here at Our Redeemer who is living in that duplex. And so we, together with Resurrection Lutheran Church in Verona, are uh, partnering with our Synod's Christian Aid and Relief to help uh, the families, all of them who were involved in this fire, get back on their feet as they lost absolutely everything, their possessions. So if you'd like to contribute to that, uh, gifts uh, can be made out just simply to Our Redeemer. You can go on our website to the Give Now section of our church website and make a donation there. And in the memo line, put Verona Fire Help, and uh, that would be greatly appreciated. We're gathering gifts through October 22nd. And then in partnership with our Synod's Christian Aid and Relief, I think we'll be able to do a lot of real good for some real people. So uh, keep that in, in your, your thoughts and prayers and as we uh, seek to help these families out. That's the only announcement I have. You're invited to stick around for our Sunday School and Bible Study Hour that begins at 9.15. God be with you and bless you. <laughs>